Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we'll provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. Pakistan grapples with consequences of nurturing Islamist extremists for geopolitical gains. Pakistan are restarting at deploying hybrid terrorists to keep Kashmir tense and burning. Taliban now destroying musical instruments, declare music immoral and corrupt. Let's begin the show with Pakistan, where a suicide bombing in a political rally killed more than 50 people and injured over 200 people. The country is grappling with an alarming rise in terror attacks, all of which have surged in the aftermath of Taliban's takeover in neighboring Afghanistan. Join us as we delve into the complexities of the security crisis, exploring its causes, consequences and the challenges that lie ahead. We have a special report. Chaos, panic and bloodshed. A devastating blast ripped through a political gathering in Bajau district of northwest Pakistan. A suicide bomber detonated his explosives at a political rally of Jamiat Ulema Islam Fazl. JUIF is a hardline political party led by Maulana Fazlur Rahman, a key member of Pakistan's ruling dispensation. At least 54 people were killed and more than 150 were injured in the blast. काफी मर्गरी अभी पशाहदत बाने और सेदर और काफी मर्गरी जख्मियां दी जो खुदे वक्त को एक पर जाती तवर बाने ठीक है ना वो बाहर के मर्गरों का नुकसान जानी और सेदर है रे The Afghan branch of the Islamic State (ISK), short for Islamic State of Khorasan has claimed responsibility for the attack, issuing a statement on its Telegram channel. The group stated, the attack comes in the natural context of the ongoing war waged by the Islamic State against democracy as a regime hostile to true Islam and in conflict with its divine law. Lately, ISK has intensified its attacks in Afghanistan, targeting both Taliban-affiliated groups and Afghanistan's minorities. The JUIF, with ideological ties to the Afghan Taliban, has been ISK's target in the past too. The ISK is critical of the JUIF's connections with the government of Pakistan and the Taliban, alleging that the JUIF has compromised its Islamic principles in the process. The terror attack in Pakistan's Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is also a stern reminder of the worsening security situation in the country's border region with Afghanistan. Ever since the Taliban stormed back to power in Afghanistan in August 2021, Pakistan has witnessed a rise in terror incidents. In January this year, at least 74 people were killed in a blast in Pakistan's Peshawar, carried out by the Tehrik e Taliban, and just a month later, Another attack in the same region claimed over 100 lives. In some ways, Pakistan is facing the consequences of its long-standing strategy of supporting Islamist extremists for geopolitical purposes. On the other hand, as far as Pakistani deep state and the government is concerned, uh, this has been called upon themselves. They are the ones who have been having the snakes in the backyard. They are the ones who have been trying to do it. They are the ones who have nurtured these terror groups. They are the ones who have been involved with developing ISIS, ISIS Taliban, other groups. Taliban, tehreek taliban Pakistan, we know, has been uh, against the government and they've been fighting for quite some time now. There is a problem in Balochistan and Pakistan. Pakistan today is a failed state, economically, financially. And the great reason for that is because it has become a haven of terrorism, extremism, radicalization, cross-border terrorism against India. 
The resurgence of the Taliban in Afghanistan appears to have emboldened their Pakistani counterparts, allowing the emergence of ISK as the most potent armed opposition in Kabul. The porous borders between Afghanistan and Pakistan, once used by Pakistan to support militancy in Afghanistan, now facilitate the spread of terror across the frontier. As the political atmosphere of the country becomes intense and charged, the security challenge has grown even bigger for Pakistan. Observers say, with Pakistani Taliban and Islamic State becoming more lethal by day, Islamabad must batten down the hatches for the country's security apparatus doesn't seem capable and signs of negotiations are nowhere in sight. Recent weeks in Kashmir have witnessed a surge in attacks on soft targets and most of them were shot by hybrid terrorists. They are the unlisted radicalized persons who carry out terror strikes and slip back into their routine life. Security forces are considering them as a new threat and challenge in the valley. Recently, Jammu and Kashmir police apprehended a hybrid terrorist of the Al Badr terror outfit. A report. One of the core elements of Pakistan's foreign policy that it relentlessly pursues is keep Kashmir tense and burning. Pakistan's plots vis-a-vis -vis India are both sinister and deadly. But having failed in all its diabolical designs, Pakistan has now employed a new unconventional tactic of using hybrid terrorists to achieve its objectives. Hybrid terrorists are neither typical terrorists who swear allegiance to one or the other terrorist group, nor do they rely on conventional modes of carrying out terrorist attacks. But they are radicalized enough to execute terrorist operations and then easily blend back into society. Lately, there has been a surge in attacks on soft targets across the valley, including in Srinagar, raising alarm among the local populace. Most of these attacks have been executed by pistol-wielding youth who do not appear on the radar of security agencies as recognized terrorists. Recently, security forces managed to apprehend a hybrid terrorist affiliated with the band Al Badr Outfit, identified as Artab Yusuf in Srinagar. During the arrest, police seized incriminating materials including a pistol, 20 live rounds and two magazines, indicating the seriousness of his intentions. Preliminary investigations have revealed that Yusuf was involved in terror-related activities in South Kashmir range and had arrived in Srinagar with sinister plans, but he was captured before he could launch his project. They perform the terrorist activities very rarely. On the face of it, they work in normal jobs, they have normal businesses. In other words, they are as common citizens as the people around in that area. But for one or two specific operations, they are told to perform and kill people whom the terrorists have in the hit list. These Pakistan-nurtured hybrid terrorists predominantly target unarmed individuals such as businessmen, activists, off-duty policemen who are unlikely to offer resistance. They skillfully leverage technology and social media platforms to disseminate messages of violence and intimidation. Their modus operandi are a combination of traditional insurgency elements and the sophistication of modern warfare. Security officials say their selection of target is anything but random. Their approach entails careful observation of movement patterns of the target and identifying vulnerable points in their target daily routine. The individuals responsible for spotting and facilitating attacks might not be on the police list, but they possess the means and intent to carry out killings similar to mercenary shooters hired to eliminate specific targets. As a result, the security forces are grappling with unprecedented challenges in combating these elusive adversaries. 
The hybrid terrorists operate covertly, skillfully mingling with the civilian population, which makes it extremely difficult for the security forces to identify and neutralize them. It becomes pretty difficult to identify a person who's going to suddenly spring up as a hybrid terrorist. Whereas for the case of a conventional terrorist, the details of such a person are available with the security forces operating in that area and the latest electronic surveillance means are employed to keep a tab on him or her as the case may be. But this luxury is not available for a hybrid terrorist because it is not known till he or she has carried out the attack and more often than not, such people carry out attacks, ensuring that there are no CCTV cameras operating in that area, ensuring that the place where they're carrying out the attack is not a high threat area, as a result of which their appearances are rarely captured. Hence, to counter hybrid terrorism is much more challenging for security forces as compared to capturing a conventional terrorist. Despite the ongoing turmoil, the communities in Jammu and Kashmir are rallying together, rejecting violence and fostering unity to counter this menacing threat. Education and awareness play vital roles in dismantling the ideology that fuels hybrid terrorism. While the road to peace in Jammu and Kashmir may be fraught with challenges, a collective endeavour coupled with addressing the root cause instill hope for a future where tranquility and harmony will prevail and not chaos and violence. The Taliban's government in Kabul has imposed various restrictions leading to worsened security conditions for the ordinary citizens in Afghanistan. Activities deemed unacceptable according to the interpretation of Islamic law have been prohibited. Recently, the Taliban destroyed musical instruments taken from the public, claiming that music promotion led to moral corruption and that playing it would lead the youth astray. Here's a report. Since the Taliban group seized control of Afghanistan in August 2021, the lives of Afghanistan's common people have depreciated from bad to worse. The group has imposed a strict interpretation of the Sharia law without considering the consequences. Recently, the Taliban publicly burned a pile of confiscated musical instruments worth thousands of dollars in the western province of Herat, terming music as immoral in accordance with their version of the Sharia law. Taliban officials, while justifying their actions, said that promoting music caused moral corruption and playing it will cause the youth to go astray. Last year, a video from Afghanistan went viral showing a musician being humiliated by the soldiers of the Afghan Taliban. Following the Taliban's return to power, many artists and musicians fled the country and sought asylum in Western countries. The Taliban considers music to be against the teachings of Islam. Taliban is imposing the crudest form of Sharia law. Uh, it was very well known when USA signed a deal with Taliban. They were giving an excuse to the rest of the world that Taliban has changed, they have become moderate and they are more human friendly and they will perhaps give more freedom to the people, but there was nothing like that. It was very well known and I think uh, most of us commented that that will not happen. Taliban will do exactly what they were doing earlier. Now we can see as to uh, those protections have come true and US in a hurry to move out from there was making all kinds of stories uh, to give a moderate version of Taliban. Now uh, people in Afghanistan they have lost all the freedom. The freedom, whether it is artistic freedom, freedom to speech, freedom to do anything. And uh, the biggest uh, sufferers are the women. So, uh, as far as the artists are concerned, as far as free speech is concerned, I think uh, Taliban has uh, ruined everything 
and for years because it will take time uh, for it to settle down. And it's not only Taliban and it's not only Afghanistan. This impact is going to even spread further. Last week, salons across Afghanistan were ordered to shut down on the Taliban's orders. Taliban, which has caused the economy of Afghanistan to collapse, did not consider that beauty salons were one of the sources of revenue available to Afghan women and was also a cherished space for Afghani women to socialize. In the past two years, the Taliban have imposed other severe restrictions under their strict interpretation of Islamic law. As for the Afghan women, the endless atrocities have resulted in being systematically squeezed out of public life. Previously, the Taliban had prohibited Afghan women from doing jobs, hindering their economic stability and making them incapable of feeding their families. The warnings and urges by the international community and the UN to Taliban for revoking their bans on Afghan women now seem to fall on deaf ears because the lives of Afghans continue to suffer. I do believe the UN uh, is, you know, it, it, it's, it's not real protests and warnings and things like that. It's really more of a masquerade and a charade. The real UN action will only happen if and when uh, Afghanistan becomes a sort of hub for terrorism like it, it had become in the late 1990s. Uh, I think uh, they will straddle a very careful line where they will uh, slowly be imposing more of their uh, uh, native Afghan interpretations of what the law should be uh, as uh, while uh, very carefully avoiding global terrorism. So uh, till that happens, nothing's going to happen and the Taliban know this very well. The Taliban's governance model has led to a lack of recognition from any UN member state due to its inflexible and uncompromising nature and the wrong interpretation of the Sharia law. Now Afghanistan is the only country in the world where girls are banned from attending high schools and effectively from political participation. Taliban today is a primitive government imposing harsh rules, erasing centuries of female progress in Afghanistan. Prohibiting music, songs and positive forms of entertainment and systematically culling the social life of Afghan women could fuel frustration, anger and hostility, especially amongst the youth. Furthermore, suppressing freedom and creativity will lead to the decay of Afghan society, conveying a message that the Afghan people are socially stagnant and incapable of leading a normal life. Pakistan-based terror outfits are adopting new ways to carry out terror activities in India's Jammu and Kashmir. Indian security forces have apprehended many lashkar e taiba terror outfits in recent days who are trying to carry out activities with different modus operandi. Today we are joined by Captain Anil Gaur, a defence expert, to speak on this issue. Welcome to the show, Captain Gaur. There has been a sudden increase in activities of Pakistan-based lashkar e taiba terror outfit in Jammu and Kashmir. What is the reason? Lashkar Taiba is basically a homegrown organization which believes in the implementation of the Sharia and also wants its aim is that it establishes a caliphate in Kashmir and also merges Kashmir with Pakistan. Now with these aims we find that there are still elements which are working on this because using the religion of Islam this way they have been able to brainwash quite a few gullible minds and that is why we find that these are this is the only organizations whose underground and overground workers are there in Kashmir at present. I, Pakistan ISI since it realized that most of the trained terrorists have been eliminated has now sent its signals and its instructions to the LAT cadre whichever is there that you should do now things like attacking the security forces or doing the uh, like we have seen that random killings or throwing a grenade somewhere so that it appears that Kashmir is not normal and there is uh, turmoil over there. 
LET has adopted new techniques to carry out terror activities. Recently, a LET operative was caught with perfume bottle shaped explosives. What do you have to say about this? See, LET does not have the any uh, capability to attack the security forces per se because most of their trained uh, terrorists who were there, militants were there, they have been eliminated. Now what is left is only the underground overground workers who do not have proper training in arms and uses of arms etc. Therefore, they are mostly dependent upon planting IEDs or throwing a grenade somewhere or doing a random killing through a pistol. Now, this is what has now prompted the ISI to ask these people to do these things so that an impression is given that Kashmir is not normal. Pakistan's Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif at recently held SEO summit has promised to take action against terror groups. Do you believe Islamabad has any such intention? The basic problem with Pakistan is that they are now a state which propagates and uses terrorism as a state policy. And therefore, ISI and the army, they are never let, going to let go sending in terrorists into the Indian territory of Jammu and Kashmir because they feel that if they stop that, then the people of Pakistan will start questioning them as to why you have stopped this and why since the last 75 years you have been saying that Kashmir Banega Pakistan but you have stopped supporting the terrorists over there and therefore whatever the Prime Minister, whatever the civilian government may keep saying but the army and the ISI are the ones who run these terror camps and they are the ones who push in these terrorists into the Indian territory. Thank you so much for your insight, sir. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.